Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I'm Doug McWilliams. I'm the executive chairman of CBR, and uh, my evening job is I'm the Gresham Professor of Commerce, which is uh, it's one of these things. It seems like a fancy title when you apply for it. It's only afterwards you discover that you've got to, to give about 700 hours a year in work to do the seven public lectures you're forced to do. And uh, that's really about as much as the average Frenchman works in a year. I slightly exaggerate to, to make my point. Um, so it, it's an interesting part-time evening job. But it has given me the opportunity to look at some of the underlying trends that uh, we face as we try to adapt to the changing economic world and the development of the Asian economies, which are sort of emerging from darkness and poverty and starvation into something that looks suspiciously like prosperity. Um, the world economy has got into quite a sweet spot as far as the UK is concerned. Growth is recovering. If you look at uh, air freight, which is probably the best single monthly indicator of world trade, uh, it's up about 8% year on year, which is consistent with reasonable world growth. But it's not just a sweet spot. Uh, it's a sweet spot because the traditional UK export markets are the parts of the world economy that are accelerating. The United States, it cut its budget deficit by more in one year last year than George Osborne's planning for an entire parliament. And because of that, it's now in a, I mean, it's extraordinary. They got nearly 2% growth last year. Uh, but because uh, uh, if you cut the budget deficit by 4% of GDP and still get 2% growth, you're doing really well. But clearly, they're going to be bouncing forward this year. Europe is going to grow. I would put it much more strongly than that. Our forecast is 0.8%, which, uh, you know, if you call that a success, then you're set setting the bar fairly low. Um, but it's positive, not negative, and we still export a disproportion of our exports to continental Europe. And um, Asia, meanwhile, is consolidating, and large parts of Asia are actually slowing down. Now, that is not normally good news, but as long as there's enough growth elsewhere, it's not such bad news, because the Asian economies consume energy and commodities disproportionately. And with Asia slowing down, there is negative pressure on both energy prices and on oil prices which means that we've got um, a, a rather sweet position with demand picking up and inflation falling down. And those two things together make the outlook for the consumer a fair bit better. As a result, we in the UK have got uh, a, a reasonable amount of economic growth. It could be as much as 3% this year. It won't be too far short of it. Uh, our, our official forecast at the moment is 2.7, but we're revising it. I don't yet know whether it'll go up or down. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's quite a good position to be in. And our analysis is that the factors that will make it slow, which will be the fact that George Osborne's given up on deficit cutting until the election, and the fact that, um, uh, 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 and you'll have to do more after the election, and the fact that the balance of payments, we start with a deficit of uh, 65 billion, and it can only go up as we import much more than we export. That will come in and start to affect things. But they'll probably not bite on our forecast really until 2016. And of course, as far as the Chancellor is concerned, the election will be over by then. And so he has got a reasonable prospect of growth in the run-up to the election. This year is, I think, going to be particularly strong for business investment, which has been depressed for a long time. But as we can see here, based right in the middle of the flat white economy, the uh, new economy of all the, uh, the whizzy, techy people who sort of go from culture through marketing through to uh, uh, the really more tech stuff like software design and, uh, 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 and information communications technology, um, that really is taking off and exploding in the UK. Uh, it's partly driven by the fact we have more online retailing than any 
other major economy, and also we have more online advertising than any other major economy. And these two things uh, both are helping drive the very buzzy, flat, white economy. So we've got growth, and really there are three important issues to think about on the global economy, which is, will the Chinese have a hard landing? They've got quite a good track record of avoiding it, but uh, sometimes by taking steps that limit their options in the future. At the moment, they've got credit out of control and are trying to bring it back under control. On the other hand, they've got quite a lot of fiscal ammunition they can use. I think they can avoid it, but we, as well as these things, you have to keep your fingers crossed. The United States is doing so well that they've already started to rein back a monetary policy and they're tapering their boost to monetary growth. Um, the tapering itself is, at the moment, just a sort of pebble in the ocean, really, and it's not going to change things dramatically. But I would think they'll taper quite aggressively through the current year if growth is as successful as we expect it to be. <coughs> if you look at the Middle East, where a large amount of um, energy is based, um, the number of areas of conflict is growing and they are involving all sorts of regional players and uh, I see the Americans think they've done a deal with the Iranians but it's not a hundred percent certain that the Iranians have actually agreed to do anything but for public consumption they're saying they haven't and um, whether uh, ultimately it changes the situation or whether it makes people like the Saudis decide they need nuclear weapons is still not quite clear. But the Middle East looks like one of these powder kegs that uh, could go off at any time. And most of the things that could happen there uh, will push up the price of oil. The biggest question for the UK, and I've got five questions for the UK, is how sustainable is the growth? Um, I said our take on it is two good years and then it starts to slow. Mind you, in our slowing down years, we're talking about growth of between one and a half and two percent. That's not a disaster by any means. The Japanese would be delighted with that as a result. I think these days most of the continental Europeans would be delighted with that as a result. But it, it, the, the economy isn't going to look as hot in 2016 as it does at the moment. Um, the other side of the story is how quickly they need to tighten monetary policy. George Osborne, whatever you think of him as a chancellor, is a master political tactician. And he realised, when he saw it was going to be difficult to get the economy going, he pulled every lever into fast forward. Now, the problem with running an economy is you try things and they don't work, so you try them a bit more and they don't work, and you try them a bit more and they still don't work. And then you try them a bit more and suddenly all the effects of the previous things that you tried earlier, they all come in at the same time. So he may have over the pudding. We may actually have growth that's a bit too fast this year. Um, from a sustainable point of view. Fortunately, the inflationary indicators are pointing downwards, which is why I say we're in a sweet spot. And I think um, they probably will have to start raising interest rates. But I think if the Bank of England does it, possibly if it starts a bit earlier than expected, the narrative has to be very strongly that we're doing it early and slowly to try and make sure we don't have to raise rates as high as we might otherwise would have had to. Is there a housing bubble? A little bit at the top end of the market in London, um, but uh, not really for the country as a whole. We could get one, but we're not there yet. Um, they've already started pulling back one of the levers, which is the funding for lending scheme, which is no longer uh, uh, applied to housing. I think they'll probably find that they're in the sweet spot there. Very important this, because the one economic variable we've discovered correlates really well with the YouGov CEBR uh, consumer confidence is the housing market. And uh, so prospects of a continued rise in confidence are very much based on the housing market. Now, in political terms, to deal with the question that, in a sense, Peter posed, what is the follow through from UK growth into disposable income and living standards? Uh, traditionally, um, there's been a very close correlation between living standards and UK growth. The emergence of the um, fast-growing economies in the East has broken that link because it's meant 
that uh, you've had a separate factor pushing up the prices of primary commodities, energy and things like that, which is so essential for us. And also because they have provided a degree of competition in effect in the labour market, which keeps wages down. Now, I forecast, my last question lecture said that over the next 40 years, on average, consumer spending in cash terms will grow a quarter of a percent per annum more slowly than GDP. But in real terms, it will grow about half a percent per annum more slowly than GDP uh, because of the need to keep the pound fairly low uh, to compete and because of the need to face rising uh, primary product prices, which I think will start rising again as we move on uh, beyond the next few years. Um, that will put a squeeze on living standards. However, the faster the economic growth, if you deduct half percent, uh, the faster the rate of living standard growth. And I think we will see living standard growth uh, return to a reasonable extent to the UK uh, before the next election. It won't be as well distributed as it had been in the past because, as uh, Peter pointed out, part of the narrative is that the rich are getting richer and the poor not getting very much richer. And I think that is a, a, the global forces making that happen. And so it, not everyone will gain as much in the rise in living standards as, uh, as the average. But still, uh, there will be a rise in living standards, I'm pretty certain, partly uh, boosted by falling inflation. Now, final thing, post-election, with a change in government, fundamentally change economic policy. On the whole, I think not. Um, there are various options, including, and the most likely ones seem to be different permutations of coalition. But I do think that uh, other than having a slightly different mix of policy in terms of tax and public spending, actually the constraints are so aggressive on a small economy like the UK, which by 2050 will only be 1.5% one, one of world GDP, so we shouldn't sort of get uh, delusions of grandeur. We actually are not that important in terms of the world economy. Uh, the constraints forced upon us are such that governments are forced very much into the centre. And my guess is that even if we did have a change in government, there would be slightly higher taxes for the rich. There would probably be a mansion tax if uh, 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 the two left-wing parties are in coalition. But other than that, I find it hard to see that the world would be fundamentally different. So those are our views. I'll now hand over to Charles Davis, who is Associate Director at CBR, and he has done the nitty-gritty on what the survey does, and he will tell you the interesting stuff. Thank you very much.